Okay, so uh, let's start. Um, hello, everyone. We will talk today about replacing uh, traditional uh, legacy IP tables with eBPF and Kubernetes clusters with CDU. We are from SUSE. Uh, I'm Michal. This is Swami. This is Swami, yeah. And uh, yeah, let's start from the question what's wrong with uh, traditional IP tables? So there are several things wrong uh, from the point of view of Kubernetes clusters. First of all, IP tables is a technology which has 20 years and it was designed mostly for simple IP address and port matching, which is a good approach for like traditional server applications uh, for the time where we don't have like huge clusters and huge high availability. Uh, but uh, in the era of Kubernetes clusters is um, not enough in our opinion. Uh, the other issue is that uh, IP tables is not fully really aware of the L7 protocols, so you, don't, uh, you can't filter uh, uh, the HTTP calls, for example, you can't filter uh, particular databa uh, database queries. It's all based on IP addresses and ports, so layer 3, layer 4. And the other thing is that uh, IP tables operates on the concept of chains and rules and to uh, add a rule to the chain, uh, you basically operate on the uh, linked list. So uh, every operation except of insert is ON. So like searching over the uh, chain of rules or modifying uh, the particular rule is always the like uh, average ON operation. Uh, and that's why um, and Kubernetes currently uh, uses IP tables extensively. So the tradition, uh, so when you use Kubernetes with the most of CNI plugins, uh, you use IP tables for mainly two things. First thing is implementing surfaces with Kube proxy. Uh, and the second thing are uh, network policies for uh, filtering the traffic. But the, uh, and uh, it sometimes ends up with so much IP tables and so much sadness. Uh, but there is one technology which tries to address that. Uh, it's BPF, which was already mentioned in previous presentations uh, uh, in the dev room. But to briefly introduce it, it's a virtual machine in the kernel, which allows you to write programs in the subset of C language. Uh, which uh, filters and traces the packets uh, in the kernel, or uh, it can also be used to trace the uh, kernel function calls. But in case of Cilium and in case of our talk, we focus more to, uh, on the networking side of BPF. <laughs> and Swami will talk uh, about details so, of his um, network stack. So thanks, uh, Michal. So Michal actually explained about what are the issues that we are having with IP tables. So everyone uh, here will be aware about the Linux network stack and how complex it has been. Um, so the design process of the Linux has been uh, for years and um, the layers are pretty compact and each layers uh, talk to each other layers. And uh, if any packet has to process, they have to process through all these packets, all these layers. And uh, we do have the net filter layer in between. Uh, so in order to get rid of the net, net filter uh, layer, we need to come up with uh, a similar filtering capability with the BPF. So what we are doing is, the, uh, as uh, the previous sessions also discussed about the hook points, so the BPF has different hook points in the networking stack. So you can see the different hook points that the BPF has. And using these hook points, uh, we can actually achieve the similar functionality that IP filter has and has been providing for the uh, customers for years. So, um, so this is a, just a comparison about the legacy IP tables and uh, enhanced version of the IP tables with the NF tables um, that have been used, and then the BPF filters with the host driver and the BPF filter with the hardware upload. So you can see uh, there's a substantial uh, increase in performance by using the BPF filters against IP tables. Uh, so this picture uh, gives you an overview of uh, how the BPF utilizes the filtering capabilities that IP filter used to do for the networking. 
So uh, in this picture, we are seeing uh, the five different uh, chains that are currently available for any packet to traverse these chains. Uh, so the decisions are made based upon where the packet needs to reach, whether it's going to be inbound, whether it's going to be outbound, whether it's going to be uh, egressed or ingressed. So based on that, you can see um, the yellow loops in here. Those are the net filter <coughs> capabilities, uh, positions that we are having. And then uh, the routing decisions are happening in the input and forwarding and output, as well as the natting is happening either in the pre-routing or in the post-routing. So in, in case um, we wanted to achieve the same functionality with BPF filters, um, we are planning to have the BPF code running um, in any one of the hook points that we already mentioned, but in, for the example case, we are taking that we are actually uh, applying the BPF code in the uh, TC hook point. So by uh, applying this, we are going to achieve similar uh, functionality. I'm going to show you the picture here. So the pink region that you're seeing here, the, both the pink boxes are the BPF programs that are running on the hook points for the TC. And uh, those chains that we have shown here are the uh, ingress chain, forwarding chain, and output chain. And we also have the, the natting capabilities as well for the pre-routing and post-routing. Uh, but for uh, simplicity purposes, I have taken these three chains in order to explain uh, how we are achieving it through BPF. And also connection tracking is involved. Uh, so in, in all these cases, uh, we do have a hook point on the TC. When the packet enters, uh, the hook point actually uh, takes into consideration that there is a packet arriving and there, there is a BPF program that has been programmed to uh, take care of it. So it takes care either in the ingress chain or out, out of the egress chain and then uh, it applies the uh, filtering rules based upon what we have configured. Uh, so the, um, I think in the previous session also, we saw that uh, BPF filters has the capability that you can actually point one BPF filter to another BPF filter, which is called as BPF uh, tail calls. Uh, so we can achieve a similar filtering capabilities with respect to BPF tail calls, uh, where each of the eBPF uh, program can actually uh, do a partial filtering on based on what the content has been uh, derived for. So basically, one can do a header parsing, the other can do an IP lookup. Uh, so all these things changed together can actually provide a, a filtering capability that IP tables can provide. And all these things are happening dynamically without any uh, intrusion or without any kernel reprogramming. So that's the advantage of BPF program. Uh, I'll give back to Michal to take it over from here. Yes, so uh, here are uh, examples of the other projects in Cilium that are using BPF. There is a load balancer written by Facebook, which is open source, uh, which is called Catran. Perf, the utility, Linux utility, is using BPF already for uh, tracing the kernel function calls. Systemd has a basic uh, firewall based on BPF, so you can uh, define basic rules for uh, services. Suricata is using BPF extensively. Uh, Open vSwitch has the uh, AFXDP driver. AFXDP is uh, the uh, let's say alternative to DPDK, although DPDK itself is also supporting it. So DPDK, in DPDK, normally uh, you expose the network device directly to the user space, and DPDK has the net network driver to, um, it, um, to use that network card, but in case of AFXDP, uh, you, you use the network drivers in the kernel, uh, but um, uh, you have the direct memory access to the network card and you can uh, bypass the rest of uh, Linux kernel network abstraction you've seen uh, in the previous slides and redirect the packet directly to the user space. So it's like similar to DPTK in terms that uh, uh, it's uh, a, a data path acceleration technology. There is also, uh, you can use AFXDP as a PMD driver in DPTK actually, but yeah, uh, you are still using the uh, network device drivers in kernel. And yeah, the list of uh, projects using BPF will grow and grow in the time. Uh, and these are companies which are using BPF. Uh, so Google, Red Hat, Netflix, uh, SUSE, we are using it uh, because uh, we are uh, in our distribution of Kubernetes, uh, SUSE container as a service <coughs> platform. Uh, we are using Cilium as the uh, CNI driver. So we explained what BPF is uh, briefly. 
and uh, now we will talk more about Cilium itself and what kind of features it has. So Cilium uh, uh, consists of several components. The main of it is the agent, which runs on every node uh, in the Kubernetes cluster, and it actually takes care of uh, generating the BPF programs and uh, loading them into the, uh, into the kernel. And you have several other components to, uh, to interact with Cilium, like the CLI, uh, like uh, plugins to different uh, container runtimes uh, uh, or the policy repository. And speaking about CNI itself, uh, yeah, maybe it's uh, too much to, uh, to talk because we have five minutes left, but yeah, CNI is the specification uh, used by Kubernetes for creating or deleting the network uh, interfaces. Uh, and CNI plugins are responsible for, uh, create, uh, for creating the network interface, uh, uh, getting the IP address and Cilium is implementing all of that. So basically when you create the pod with kubectl, you of course call firstly the uh, Kubernetes API server, the kubelet takes that request and uh, kubelet uh, calls the CRI and the CRI can be uh, Docker shim, container D or cryo. And then usually the CRI uh, implementation calls the CNI plugin to create, the, uh, to create the network interface and provision the networking for the pod. And in case of Cilium, uh, Cilium has its uh, CNI plugin which uh, uh, calls the Cilium agent to request the IP address and then to, uh, it calls Cilium agents to actually create the BPF programs which uh, will handle the filtering and uh, uh, in case you are using Cilium for uh, handling the packet encapsulation uh, to the nodes, it's also handled by BPF programs which uh, Cilium agent creates. And then uh, the communication between those BPF programs which are loaded into the kernel uh, goes through BPF maps which are exposed to uh, the user space. So Cilium agent, after generating the BPF program, compiling it, loading it to the kernel, it uh, keeps in contact with the BPF program by using uh, maps. And this is like the more general uh, overview of how BPF looks like and how it works when we use it together with Cilium, but also, for example, if you use AFXDP, which I mentioned to uh, do uh, data plane acceleration to VMs and containers. And uh, Swami? It's your turn so, to... uh, so here is the details about the CNI plugin. As um, as he mentioned about uh, how the CNI plugin gets involved in uh, providing a networking um, access and providing IP address management and all those things. So these are the internals that you can see when CNI uh, is configured, uh, where you have each of the containers has an internal um, interface and it has an um, uh, an LXC interface uh, within the CNI and also a, a physical interface to a node and, and the nodes are interconnected in a cluster. So the networking modes and then the policy will be taken care of by uh, Michal. Yes, so uh, there are two networking modes basically in Cilium. Uh, you can uh, use Cilium to actually ex encapsulate packet between nodes and the traditional mode, uh, like traditional uh, the default method of doing that is VXLAN. But in case you want to use BGP or in case you are uh, deploying your Kubernetes cluster in the uh, cloud environments like LWS or uh, GKA, you can uh, use the direct routing where Cilium doesn't route packets between nodes but you rather use something else to do that. And uh, yeah, the most popular case of using the second mode is uh, uh, using it in AWS where you have ENI and uh, uh, also the, um, so yeah, basically the first method uh, is more for bare metal installations and the second for cloud providers or bare metal with BGP. And in case of uh, the first option, uh, you have overlay routing uh, tunneling mode and you have the additional uh, network header related to VXLAN, which is handled by Cilium. And uh, in the case of the other one, you have source destination and payload and uh, that's it. 
Uh, and let's talk about uh, packet filtering right now. So Kubernetes already provides by, uh, by itself the abstraction called network policies, which applies on uh, layer three and layer four. Uh, and uh, one of the forms of uh, L3 filtering is uh, label-based ingress filtering. So let's imagine we have two labels, uh, two kind of rows in, in the clusters. Okay. Um, so uh, you have front-end and back-end pods, and uh, so you can allow uh, only front-end pods to contact the back-end, but uh, uh, deny everything else. And there are examples also of uh, uh, egress filtering, where you restrict the pod to connect to the outside world. Uh, you have also a for filtering for uh, blocking uh, the uh, uh, for allowing only particular pods to connect uh, ports to connect in and a uh, filtering which also uh, takes uh, care about uh, uh, acknowledging HTTP protocols uh, or uh, HTTP endpoints you can connect to. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, so unfortunately we can't talk much about Envoy because our time is up. Uh, do you have any questions? But in the case of I think EDPF, um, uh, the way the CDM has been implemented, it is, is, is a little bit different than what I showed because I, I wanted to show a theoretical approach of how it has been handled in order for, for us to get an understanding of how it is handled. But in the case of EBPF, uh, that Celium does is it has a map of like uh, a source IP, source port, and yeah, then the- IP tables and NF tables can do that as well. So yeah. if the problem is scaling, then you can already do it with native IP tables too. No, it's not just the um, uh, IP, that's what I think uh, Mihal mentioned. It's not just because of uh, IP and port. The advantage that we have with Celium is based on labels, okay? And you can actually provide uh, label-based label filtering where you cannot do it that in the filtering. And also in the case of um, uh, the Q proxy, Q proxy basically uses IP tables, and we have seen uh, a degradation in performance when there are a lot of IP table rules yeah, that are handled. You don't have to add more IP tables, that's the point. You have IP set and yeah, so e even by including IP set or, or even by going with a new version of uh, IP tables, the NF tables, we have seen a degradation in performance and it would. Uh, sorry, I'm very sorry, we need to remove your change operator. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you.